Now this is just another form of wall with the same coping along the top painted white. Uh, it's just a bit more ornate. Um, the house on the right is an earlier building with high ceilings and an underslung veranda. And it's quite grand, so the, the fence is quite grand. The, the house in the background has got a bullnose roof, a bullnose veranda rather. So that's been built a bit later, perhaps 10 years later. Uh, lower ceilings and the fence, although in this, much the same form as the, the front one here, is just a bit smaller in scale. And it's just um, how they used to match the fence basically with the house. They sort of went together. This is a, uh, this is a contrast to the, the photo before, which was a bluestone uh, base to it. This is all limestone. It's been built with a wider um, base course up to a plinth of bricks. And then and it's all, yes, it hasn't been built. Sometimes they were built with bluestone along the base because the bluestone they thought was a bit harder. But this wall is in quite good order and the coping is all in good order as well. They're all, this particular coping you can see the string course underneath the curve bit is square and some of them were called cant bricks which are on a little, on an angle like the first photo. And this is just a bit fancier version. Uh, I think this is in the corner of Todd Street, the big two-storey brick place. With the red, red bricks and the cream bricks. It's just another example, but it's a bit of a one-off. Tortola. This is just a photograph of the front and the back of, this, of, a, of a wall that's all, all in one. You can see the front here has got the, the, uh, the bricks cut at 45 degrees. That's a bit, they're a bit fancier and a bit more expensive. And the cheaper option for the back was just to run the bricks, as you can see in the top section, just run them end to end. So you use less bricks and they were just ordinary common bricks. And you just paid for the nice top all the way around. And that's just a close up of the back of the wall, just showing the pointing. The pointing there is called struck pointing, just with a trowel as they put it on. You can see they weren't particularly fussy about trying to keep the stone showing. And this is just a plain wall, very plain, with a very plain top, with a little bit of glass sprinkled along the top. But it, um, it's surviving very well for, without the brick coping. And this is just another version it's a bit later because it's, it's a lot narrower um, and you can see a little bit of green growth halfway along that's coming through the wall. That's, that's when the walls are really in, having a bit of problem because once the wind goes through a wall it, it um, really speeds up that uh, erosion rate. Yeah, that's the front on photo of it. It's been repaired in the past with the grey cement which is holding very well but it's pushed the damp on the salty bits up halfway up the wall and so the, uh, the erosion continues. The, the really the, um, the cement's just contributed to the downfall of the wall. Mm. And this is what happens when the wind really rushes through the wall and nothing's been done. So that's, yes, I don't think that's still standing, is it? No, that one's broken down. That's, yeah, that's... Congre that's congregational church. Yeah. Yeah, okay. it's just a little bit of tender loving care and that would you'd still be held up together, but it's going to be a big job to, to rebuild along the top, all the brickwork. That was more straight. This one is the back of down the side of Benson Radiology. It's just another form, it was a quick form. A bit later on, came a bit later, they just used formwork and a lime concrete and some river gravel and built it up like that and then put a little curved top on it. 
Now this wall, um, it's been built in two sections. It was built originally up to where the left hand part of the wall is and then it was added on to, on the top, the top part's been added. You can see the stones are a different size, and quite a lot bigger. Um, Whereabouts is that one? I think, I think that's in Todd Street. I think the next photo. Yeah. Now, for some reason, they used to use a blue pointing on limestone walls and then mark it with the white lines. I'm not sure, I haven't worked out why, but I think the blue stone must have been a more expensive stone because it wasn't as readily available. And they've tried to make it look a little bit like a blue stone wall for some reason. But the normal practice is blue stone wall, blue pointing and white lines, and brown stone or pale stone, pale pointing and black lines. So that's it's a bit of an anomaly really. They've, where they've added the bit above, which is partially covered by the cement, you can see the, use the brown pointing with the new stonework above it. And this one you're probably all familiar with, the school wall. Um, it's got a nice coping, but it's made of cement. And the cement doesn't absorb water like the brick ones, the old brick ones do. So as soon as any water settles on the, that kind of thing, it runs out to the edge, down the side, and then underneath, and back onto the wall. And now the, you can see the stains on the wall. And the pointing, it looks nice, but it's all cement, hard cement. And the stone being the softest bit, that absorbs the water coming off the coping and redissolves any salts and then when they, when they dry out the salt crystals grow a bit and they cause the, the um, stones to start to disintegrate. That's on Lindock Road? Lindock Road, yeah. yeah. And this one, you do occasionally get, this is the one with the glass on the top, you occasionally get nice lime mortar but the stones seem to be softer again um, and normally in that case I'll leave the pointing there and just just cover over the stones or put another piece a small piece in but not try and dig them out completely they're not threatening the, the uh, structure at all and yeah you know you use the lime mortar you don't fill them up with cement like this here is and the cement treatment and the salt damp's gone up another layer as you all know that's what happens. Um, oh, this is the, the uh, church wall or the rectory wall in Cowan Street before before I started on it. It's got the blue stone along the base, the, the coping of red brick and then limestone, well, there's a little bit of limestone left there and to the left there's a little bit of blue stone and then a whole lot of render. And no, the, the brick pier on the right hand end is missing as well, that's fell into the garden. So that's what it looked, what it looked like once I cleaned off the, all, all the, the hard render. The blue stone looks quite good, there's nothing really wrong with that. Um, the, um, the limestone was too rickety to leave there, so I took that down and replaced it with limestone, but it had been repaired previously with the blue stone on the left there, which I'm still wondering how I'm going to point that, but <laughs> there was no point taking it off just to make, make it uh, look like it was the original. All those, the joints, they've just been filled with a, a weak lime mortar. It's, you just need to pre-fill it first. You don't try and point it all up at once. You just, it's always two coats and they're two different types of mortar. We'll talk about that a bit later. The, the first coat you put in, I usually call it a scratch coat because it's been scratched. This is 
actually an internal wall which is very salty in Saddleworth and I scratched it and then a few weeks later came back to have a look at it and you can see where the salt the salt's deposited on the tops of all the scratches <coughs> um, so that <coughs> before before the next coat went on there once it was dry it's still damp and that you rub off all the scratches which takes off any salt that's appeared during that first drying process so that you just limit the amount of salt you don't want to lock that up again with your next coat and this is the famous high street wall <laughs> that everybody be familiar with that's how it was when we found it now I'm just, you know, concentrate on each end this is obviously the southern end and we took the render off and just propped it with those props initially and then the next section we replaced that with hydraulic rams and pushed it back up straight and that that produces a horizontal crack which should be in the mix you see how much it's opened up and that's what you fill up with just bits of stone and bits of mortar and uh, that, that'll hold it vertical so you've got the uh, centre of gravity back where it should be you don't need any um, other sort of bracing for it at all and this is looking north from the gateway same thing lots of render and this is what that wall was holding back it was just somebody filled up the wall um, to try and level off the front garden perhaps but it was only dirt it, it wasn't clay so the wall had done a, a wonderful job actually holding it back without being built as a as a retaining wall and that's what it looked like after the digger had been through um, you can see on the bottom right hand of the trench the wall is actually that's actually bedrock limestone so limestone doesn't push walls over at all it's, it's just been dug into the side of the hill and the wall the the ground level is only be about half the way halfway up that wall so what you can see that the distinct lines there are three distinct lines through the stonework it's called coarse rubble work so they, they just um, lift the string up, I think it was about 18 inches and they built to, to that 18, to the string line and then they go up again. That's why when we see the pointing you'll see what you usually mark that out in the pointing just to make a note of that. Oh. So that's we're sort of partly, we're halfway along with the with the jacks straightening it and we had to pull out a lot of loose stone work where this, this join is and that was the corner once we straightened up the wall the corner was was a long way out <laughs> so, so we, we dug a little trench we had to dig a trench by hand there because of the tree right in the corner so we dug down behind it to give it room to come back with the jacks uh, and that's just another before view from the other side and now um, that's where we've straightened it up and you can see the size of the crack that opens up along the base that needs filling and you can see what looks like little a little line of cement about a foot or so down from the brickwork that's actually part of the original old blue pointing because the house was actually built with blue stone and I just wonder whether they, they used the cheaper materials and then made it look a bit smarter with the blue pointing perhaps tie in with the house that's a close up of it with a, a bit of a white line left there we try and leave some of the original like that when you do pointing even if you cover it over so that it, it's always there and this is 
were pointing part way through and we just pointed along in the courses. We didn't just do a patch from top to bottom and then move sideways because you get you get joins and diff sometimes different colours in your mortar. So we just went along at each course at about 18 inches high and, and just left a bit of a struck line or ruled line through it just to mark out where the courses had been laid. And we resurrected the little drain holes along the bottom, there are little brick drains there. And the one by itself up high must have been about where the, the soil level might have been when it was first built and that, to drain any water runoff from the ground behind it. Oh, I see they put a hole through. Mm. Now I just took these, this in Gawler. Now it's got a lot of little stones. Now if you went around every one of those with a, with a rolling tool and marked out in little squares, it gets very busy. So they've just marked it out in courses at the same height as all the cornerstones, the coins. And it just gives the wall a bit of form without looking overly busy. There are a few, a few other photos here of tricks like that. And this one's just slightly different. They've just used... It, it's actually tuck pointing, it's a raised pointing made out of lime and fine sand. It's usually very white when you first do it. And that, that there is just from a distance. This, this building was a two-storey building and it, it sort of suits the scale of the building to have great big square blocks. And this is a side view of a, another building with a similar sort of treatment with the tuck pointing. So they've done the tuck pointing down the side and across the front that faces the street. They've just used the ashlar pattern. Um, and then you can see the lines of white and it's actually in bluestone and the pointing looks brown but the, the, the pointing's actually been bleached by the sun and so if you, you chip a bit off of that you, it's always blue underneath and this is another form just for asphalt with using limestone instead of the bluestone that was on the side of a church. Oh, I just thought it might be interesting that the Germans were a big part of our settlers and this is on the road uh, heading towards Udunda and the, uh, the veranda fell off and the water's been washing the mud off the walls so it's just interesting to see the construction of the walls and I think there's a close-up did, yeah, a lot of a lot of work went into putting the, all these frames together, and then then they covered them with the sand, uh, a lot of mud mixed with straw. They've done uh, they've done remarkably well. This was a, another ba a barn um, in Hamilton on the way to Kapunda. But yes, they're not gonna, they're not going to last a lot longer. Um, and this is a building up at Farina. I don't know, some of you might have heard about Farina. I just thought I'd show you some of the things we've been doing. This was known as the new police station because there was a one that previously built as well. And it, it had lost, obviously lost the corner. And underneath the window, it was just, it looked like it needed repointing. But when you have a closer look at it, it's actually very hollow inside. And I, I had the blower in one end and blowing dust out the other end of all that. It was, so it requires taking uh, you, uh, a few essential stones out so you can get the mud and small stones back in there to hold it. Because if, if you just point that up and it's hollow inside, the wind will get at it and eventually the walls still will fall over. And up on the top, this is up on the top of the building, there was a chimney. And this is all that was left of it. 
So we cleared away the stones. And that's what was there was actually a chimney back, you know, uh, fireplaces back to back. And so we rescued a few of the stones from the falling of ground and we just rebuilt it up to that height again. And since these photos were taken, that corner that's missing, it's all been rebuilt up to roof level. But they don't intend putting a roof on it, they're just keeping them as ruins at this stage. Ah, yeah. oh, that's it. Yeah. So, any questions? Yes. Sure. Um, well, I could talk about mortars first. Yeah. Like that scratch coat I talked about, the first thing you really need to do is just fill the holes. Don't worry about what it looks like, just fill them up with a mixture of concrete sand, four parts, and one part of hydrated lime. And that will, uh, it doesn't shrink. That if you use plastering sand or building sand, bricky sand, they've got lots of clay in it, it'll shrink. It gives you, yeah, it's a bit of a pain really. Um, and don't be afraid if you throw mortar in there, push other stones, doesn't matter what the stones are, it could be bits of brick or anything, they're not going to show. Just push them in to the hole and that'll help the, the, cement, the, the mortar hold. There's been a bit of a debate about whether you should use hydraulic lime. The, the construction industry training board have been running week long um, sort of teaching, I suppose, of the looking after old walls, and they've been pushing the hydraulic line, which is a it's only made over in Europe, and it actually doesn't matter what the lime is; it's uh, it's more the, the type of sand because the, the scratch coat is, is fairly coarse; it's a concrete sand, and then for the pointing. You actually got to sift, sift the big pieces out of the um, the concrete sand, so you've got a fine sand, and then you can mix that two to one. And because you're only putting it on very thin, because you've got the scratch coat already filled in there, you're only doing perhaps five to ten millimeters thick of pointing, so that's not going to shrink, and that's the bit you put the colour in. To, you don't, don't ever look, think you're going to find sand that's going to give you the right colour because the colour comes from the clay and that clay makes it shrink so you've actually got to forget about the coloured sand. The sand's all the same underneath without the clay and you add the colours which are oxides and it's usually a combination of yellows, terracottas and black. Don't try and use dark brown or light brown, it'll turn out purple. So yes, it's just a tricks of the trade, I suppose. Um, I think that's really all. You really, yeah, you just don't look at the holes and think, well, that nothing more is going to happen. Just fill it up, just throw some of that mortar in there and just fill it up because the, the air doesn't get into the holes and it starts it pushes the moisture up higher and the, it, the wall will start collapsing further up as well. So it just makes the job a whole lot bigger. Uh, Which, what's the point of restoring these walls that they look like patched up jobs in the end? To me, the, uh, a lot of this looks like eyesores. I mean, wouldn't it be better to concentrate on a few walls that you can restore back to original and that look proper? But when you sort of patch something up that's uh, an eyesore, to me, it's <coughs> Well, you've got to, yes, you, yes, one of the hardest things is to match the colours of the existing. You can spend all morning trying to match the colour, but that's really important because otherwise, you're right, it does just look like patchwork. Sometimes it's easy just to take it all off and redo it. And the other point I'd just like to ask is, have you got any comment on the Pindock Road? Wall that's outside the primary school with all those huge concrete slides outside? Well, um, it's got a lean on it in places and that's not hard to straighten up. But the most 
costly bit really is getting rid of all that cement pointing because that's um, is suffering from that because the, if you lose your stone well that's what your wall is built out of and you can't just go and fill the holes in the stone where the stones have rotted out um, and the coping, the cement coping, it just needs an angle grinder and a groove cut along the bottom where it projects out from the wall so that when the water runs around it, it can't run back to the wall, it hits the groove and falls off before it runs onto the wall. Paul, do you have an apprentice stonemason working with you now? Not now, no. no. I have had. I've had about 10 or 12. Some of them are still in it, doing it. But I'm, I'm sick of the paperwork, so I'm quite happy to be on my own. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. A very, very informative address, and I'll now ask Jeff to uh, uh, do a vote of thanks, please, on behalf of the talk. Well, thanks very much, Peter, for a uh, very topical um, subject tonight. Uh, some years ago, you did some, you wouldn't remember, but you did some repointing for me. And happily, I'd like to say it's all still there and in perfect nick. <laughs> um, but it was um, yeah, very, very informative. Uh, it's a real challenge. I've got one of the 150, 150 walls to fix, front walls, so I might be talking about some advice at some stage if you're still working. And I'd like to go up to Freen and put a few blocks in too one day. So thank you very much, and um, if everyone could thank Peter. Yeah. Great speech. Thank you.